Hey guys, what's up? We're back with another one. So this chapter, we're going to talk about East Asia, uh, specifically from 1400 to 1800. And in section one, we're going to go to China. We're going to talk about the Ming and the Qing dynasties. So we'll start with the Ming dynasty. So they were established in 1368 after the Mongols were overthrown. So Ming emperors extended their rule into Mongolia and into Central Asia, which strengthened uh, when in turn they would strengthen their Great Wall, and then they would make peace with the nomadic tribes in the north. So the centralized government would be filled with officials chosen by civil service system, which has been a staple in Chinese culture. So you'd have your most talented people in government, not just by birthright. They had a nationwide school system, and they had increased food production with new crops available. They would renovate the Grand Canal, which would open up shipping from north to south. So the map here is basically showing you where, like, what modern China is, and then in the orange there is what the Ming Dynasty encompassed. So the first emperor, Ming Hongwu, rules from 1398 uh, until 1398, and then would be succeeded by his son, Yang Le. So Yang Le began construction of the imperial city in Beijing in 1406, and would move the capital there in 1421. This is what is now called the Forbidden City, because, especially at that time, if you were a commoner, you were not allowed to enter the imperial palace. Uh, Yang Le, uh, Yang Le sent a series of naval voyages west, which would reach as far as the East African coast. And in 1514, the Portuguese land in China, uh, but were kicked out of Guangzhou for their behavior. Uh, ideas were the most traded things, and along with some other stuff like clocks, which made Western ideas more receptive to the Chinese. Early interactions between the Europeans and the Chinese were very promising. They had a period of prosperity. The Ming Dynasty would start to decline in the late 15th century. Internal power, power struggles would lead to government corruption. So there was high taxes, low crop yields, and an epidemic that led to peasant uprisings in the 1630s, led by Li Zexing, or Zexing. The uprising would spread throughout China, and it gained control of Beijing in 1644. So the Manchus be, uh, would come in and defeat Li Zexing's armies and establish what's called the Qing Dynasty in 1644. So this is a map of what would become the Qing or Manchu dynasties, a bit bigger than the Ming, uh, the Ming Dynasty. So the Qing Dynasty. So in order to weed out the rebels, the Manchus ordered all men to wear Manchu dress and hairstyles. So among the, the hairstyles are what's called the Q, which is just a braided pigtail. And if you didn't have that, you were considered a rebel and generally killed. So the picture up at the top is what a Q is. So the Qing would gradually be, uh, become accepted, leading to some prosperity. They kept the Ming political system, but still had the problem of being ethnically and culturally different from their population. So there's two different ways they would deal with that. So first, they would try to preserve their distinct identity within Chinese society, and they would bring Chinese into imperial administrative roles in order to gain their support. Uh, the greatest ruler in Ming and Qing China was Kang Ji from 1661 to 1722. So he uh, would always wake up at dawn and work late into the night, so he put in his work more than most. In the late 17th century, Russia had been starting to push into Chinese territory, so Kang Ji and Russia would sign the Treaty of Nershinsk, which would in turn stop Russia from pushing east, extending the frontier, uh, ending, ending the frontier wars, and establishing trade between China and Russia. Kang Ji was tolerant of Christianity, but after his death, emperors became very hostile towards that religion. So the most prosperity uh, in conquered area came under 
Chang Long from 1736 to 1795. Nearing the end of his rule, he became influenced by corrupt officials in his court. In turn, they would increase taxes, which led to more unrest in rural areas. So an unhappy peasant would launch a rebellion from 1796 to 1804, which is called the White Lotus Rebellion. The Qing did end up putting down the rebellion, but the dynasty was starting to decline. So European traders wanted to work with China, but were limited to only October through March. And, could, uh, and only with licensed merchants from the government, which was not very many. So the British accepted the system until the late 18th century. Uh, they wanted more access to trade privileges like Russia had. Uh, Britain was importing more from China than they were sending to them. Uh, they also exported Indian cotton in exchange for tea, silk, and porcelain. So to cover the owed debt, the British would send silver. And in 1793, the British sent Lord George McCartney to get more trade deals with China, but Emperor Chan Long would refuse those. So from 1500 to 1800, 85% of the Chinese uh, were farmers. And from 1390 to 1800, the population would increase by more than 220 million. So with increased population, there was less land for people to hold for their own which started, uh, so they started by limiting holdings of by wealthy landowners, but over time, all arable land was being used and there wasn't any to give to anyone else. So land shortages led to more unrest and revolt. So they had a growth in manufacturing and expanded their trade in silk, porcelain, and cotton goods. So manufacturing and merchants weren't viewed the same as they were in Europe or actually seen as inferior to farmers. So merchants would buy land instead of reinvesting in their businesses, which is it can be good, it can be bad. Uh, life was centered around the family. Everyone was expected to sacrifice their individual needs for the good of the family as a whole. Uh, typical families were extended over generations. So when sons would marry, their wives move in with them, with, the, with his family, and become part of the family. Daughters would remain in the house until they were married. Then they would go and live with their husbands. Uh, family. Uh, parents and grandparents remained in the house, so you would have multiple generations living together. Chinese society consisted of different clans, which are just uh, blood-related families, linked by a council of elders and social and religious activities. Uh, men were superior to women, only ones allowed to have a formal education and work in government were men. Women were not allowed to inherit land or divorce, but men could divorce if the wife didn't produce sons, and they also could take a second wife. Women took part in what's called foot binding, which is seen as a status symbol. So women who bound their feet was, uh, started very early in their life. Um, women who needed mobility decided not to because it's very painful and it's very hard to get around. So with the increased prosperity, more Chinese citizens had money to buy books. A, few, a new form of literature grew popular with the wealthiest urban residents. Uh, one famous novel called The Golden Lotus was about how a corrupt landowner manipulated people to get what he wanted. Uh, architectural brilliance is shown in the Imperial City, which is what all these pictures are of. Uh, porcelain art is expressed in blue and white pieces uh, which were very collectible among the Europeans. So that is it for section one. We'll see you in the next one. See you guys.